Tony, you guys at the Mayo Clinic have some very, very interesting data on looking at outcomes uh, once these patients have been taken to surgery and maybe predictors of people who will do better or worse. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so, so this is interesting. So we're actually, I think, lucky that we have some surgeons who are happy not to do surgery on the patients that shouldn't get surgery. Uh, some still, you know, want to do surgery on every patient. But, but it's always good to work with a surgeon who's willing to say, give it a shot. Yeah. If, it, if, if that patient declares themselves, uh, uh, unresectable. I don't want to do that surgery. I'm happy that I haven't done it uh, on the patient. So this this sets a good stage. So we we're trying to standardize a little bit more, uh, but with with a particular practice, what we've been finding out that well, first of all, we've moved uh, for some uh, either to clinical trials or actually what we call total neoadjuvant therapy to to borrow uh, you know the term from rectal cancer meaning move the whole treatment actually uh, to prior to surgery rather than before. And, 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 and with this particular practice, what, what we've been finding uh, from, uh, uh, from the way it's been structured is perhaps similar to how you, you're doing your Fulferinox followed by uh, Jim Braxton is, if you use one regimen and it doesn't seem to essentially induce shrinkage and doesn't drop the CA99 to a certain level, less than 100 is desirable, that those patients essentially are the ones that will not do good with resection. Those patients are switched to the other regimen. So if you start with, with the OX, you go to, to uh, NAP-Paclitaxel. If you start with NAP-Paclitaxel, you go to the IROX. So Phenox, Gemabraxane, Gemabraxane, Phenox. And uh, with an attempt, and, and actually uh, it was interesting to see the data once we looked back at it, that uh, for most patients, uh, you are able to consolidate mm -hmm. the advantage by doing the switch. And there, the outcomes of some of these patients are just short of astounding. So if you select really well those patients who are most likely to be local and those that are most likely to respond to local therapy, you've tested their biology. Those patients are the ones that actually end up uh, uh, benefiting the most from surgery to the point that at least 20 percent, there may be more than 20 percent, but at least we know that 20 percent of the patients should never get surgery, even when it's clearly resectable. Those are the patients, in fact, that would do better not having surgery, going through the complications, not getting exposure to systemic therapy when they should. Uh, and those are the patients actually that may have worse survival by going to surgery than not. Yeah. And so if you select those patients out by doing, you know, different types of maneuvering, uh, uh, then I think we can optimize the outcome of these patients who go to resection. Yeah, I mean, uh, so using CA199 as a guide is very interesting, very interesting data. We've seen sort of neoadjuvant approaches and with in small trials with fulfirinox, fulfirinox with radiation, gemnab, gemnab with radiation. What are the ongoing studies that we have right now looking at, at, at patients? Ramesh, can you tell us about a few of them? For um, borderline, borderline to yeah. potentially yeah. resectable. Um, so the, I think one of the problems is there is a proliferation of single institution studies. Yes. Um, <laughs> which uh, across uh, US, Europe, uh, um, which makes it difficult to come to a consensus of what's best because it's chemotherapy followed by SBRT uh, of various um, doses, um, external beam, four to five weeks. So th there's obviously some selection bias, but I think it's increasingly important to have some randomized studies and that's starting in Europe. I think we have a randomized study of pre versus post uh, chemotherapy radiation. I think that's an important study. In the U.S., uh, there, there is an intergroup study. Um, there was a pilot study for borderline resectable cancers with Fulfurinox showed that in a multi-center uh, setting it was feasible. Our zero resection rate was about 60 percent uh, in about 35 patients. So that showed the feasibility. Uh, there is also another SWOG study looking at uh, Fulfurinox versus gemcitabine paclitaxel in potentially resectable patients that's ongoing. Uh, the challenges in a multi-center study is, uh, one is the, the staging. Mm -hmm. uh, you really need to have central review in a multi-center study because be between borderline and uh, resectable patients, uh, there is often um, no concordance. Yeah. And, and Thomas, sort of predicting who 
is going to recur. So after we go through all of this, there's some neat data about going back again to the, to the circulating tumor DNA. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what we've seen there? Yeah, well, just one, one, uh, one issue to mention. When we do neoadjuvant treatment, the main advantage is, and this is the unique chance in a trial, that you get the tissue after neoadjuvant treatment when the patient gets operated on. And you can differentiate between those responding and those not. And this may really help us in stratifying and selecting in future times the identifying biomarkers that really will give us a, a cue who, who should be uh, treated and who should not be treated preoperatively. Uh, for the postoperative se uh, setting, there is now also again the circulating tumor DNA. And if you can detect it pre-op, it disappears post-op and you can't detect RAS mutations. Essentially, there is a, it's a bit more complex than just one mutation, but it's a panel of mutations that's highly sophisticated, but what they could show is if you can, cannot detect it, prognosis, it's a good prognosis, but if uh, circulating tumor DNA reoccurs and you can find it in blood, that's bad news because that indicates micrometastases, early metastases, and those patients have a high chance of recurring early. So there might be also a chance we talked about adjuvant combination treatment, even in the absence of the evidence, but, uh, but I think sometimes we're not treating adjuvant, we're treating earlier palliative cases. Right. Right. And maybe those, are, those patients will benefit from more aggressive adjuvant approach straight away. And so this might be useful also for, for setting up trials and stratifying patient selection in the adjuvant setting when we can detect uh, tumor DNA.